Today, we're talking about the power of mom. We're going to celebrate moms today. We love moms. And we want to talk to you about a couple of heroes in the Bible that you may or may not have heard of before. And their names are Lois and Eunice. Come on, who's all heard of Lois and Eunice? Raise your hands. You've all heard of Lois and Eunice? Good. At least three of you have. The rest of you are going to be introduced to Lois and Eunice today. So here's our key verse that we're going to focus on today. And it's found in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. And it says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, this is a very familiar passage in the Bible. In fact, I know that many of us go to this verse when we're worried, when we're afraid, because we know that God has not given us a spirit of fear. Can I get an amen? So this is a very familiar verse about fear, and parenting is one of the scariest things that we will do in our lives. Is that right? Amen. I cannot agree more. And being a mom can be one of the most terrifying things that we ever do in our lives. We have three boys. Three. Three boys. I have four boys, <laughs> and the dog and the cat are also both male. <laughs> and the fish. And the fish is too, I'm sure, because that is just the way it rolls in our house. Wait, but wait, who picked the dog and the cat? She had her chance. She could have picked a girl. She picked a boy dog and a boy cat. They were the cutest. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm always completely outnumbered. It's just the way it happens in our house. So we have Jarrett. He's our oldest. And um, we'll come back to him in a minute. And then there is Aiden. He is our middle boy. He acts like a middle boy. I don't know if he's in here or not. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I see a hand waving. He's 14. He's about to be in high school. <laughs> yeah. Woo. I'm old. And then we have Cole, who's also in here. He's and way up in the way back. Way up, up in the back. He should be in class. Because he's only 10, and he has moments, I wouldn't say days, moments of where he's really cute and little and sweet boy still and wants to go in the backyard and play imaginary friends. And then the next moment, he's preaching our attitude. So that's our life right now. And if you want, really would like to see terrifying, just stop by our house unannounced after a couple of hectic weeks that we've had. And really that's like every week. So just stop by our house anytime <laughs> unannounced and you will see terrifying. And you might even smell it. <laughs> what? I don't smell anything. Again, I have four boys. <laughs> Three of them mostly live in our basement downstairs. And there's this aroma, this odor sometimes kind of drifts up the stairs. It's very wrong. Pray for me. <laughs> it's so wrong. But let's get back to Jarrett, our oldest. I can remember many years ago now when he was in first grade, we got a call from the principal and we needed to go down to the principal's office, which, you know, was a little scary. So we headed down there to find out that he had forged my signature on a disciplinary slip. So he, True story. he didn't miss recess. Yeah, M-O-M. <laughs> we got some smart ones in our family. Mom, so cute. And then fast forward all the way to two days ago, two days ago, he turned 18. Next week, he graduates high school. I'm dying a little bit. And 9-11, he leaves for the U.S. Navy. Yep. And if you don't know Jarrett, he was playing bass up here, standing right mm -hmm. over here playing bass guitar. And uh, we are very, very proud of him and honored that he is going to serve yes. uh, the greatest nation on earth and our armed forces. Yes. Amen. It's scary. 
No. Yeah. Right? It's scary. I, so. One of my scariest memories of Jarrett was actually right before he joined us in this, in, out in the open. And, uh, you know, if, when you're having your very first baby, everything is unfamiliar and terrifying. So we were three weeks away from delivery. Three weeks. In a man's world, that's like three years. We have plenty of time to do everything still. But we're just at what we thought was a regular checkup. And the doctor says, and you know how doctors do this thing? It's really annoying. They, they tell you the scariest news like it's nothing at all. Like, well, you know, there's a problem with the baby. We're going to go ahead and take the baby today. We're like, what do you mean take the baby? Where are you taking the baby? The baby's still inside. How do you take the baby? Well, we're going to go ahead and, and perform a surgery and take the baby. I'm like, hold the phone. What are you talking about? It's supposed to be three more weeks, and you're talking about taking the baby today. So they were trying to keep it chill, but apparently his umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck, and uh, they had to perform no. an emergency. Wrong story. Well, one of the kids had that, but anyway, they the, <laughs> they, <laughs> they were going to take they would have an emergency C-section that day, and uh, I was freaking out. So they said I had two hours before the surgery. So I'm literally driving through the streets of Southern California, 35 mile an hour roads, 75, 80 miles an hour, you know, screeching to the lights, taking off in my Ford Focus as fast as I can. We had our assistant from the church meet us at the house. She's at the hospital. We're throwing underwear in the back. I had, we had a car seat. We'd never opened it yet. So I'm literally ripping the box apart, sweat pouring down, trying to figure out how to put it in too, because I'm like, we got two hours and we got to be ready to go. And I think I made it that we had somehow got the, everything in there. I didn't realize that we were going to be in the hospital for four days and there was really nothing to where I could have stayed with Naomi and chillaxed and just been there. But, you know, they didn't really do a good job of communicating, but I was pretty well freaking out at that time. <laughs> Um, details. Men are not good with details, but that's okay. That sort of just. I'm telling happened. you, one of them had that thing wrapped around their neck. Yeah, that actually didn't happen well, ever. One in three shot. It was. Do you Jared. have other children that I don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if they came with an instruction manual? It would have. I know, right? They should have had an app. We could have downloaded it. An app. Oh. Do this Dad, now. You need to create that. Although I would say it wouldn't have helped you any since you don't read instruction manuals. What are you talking about? Like most men don't read instruction manuals. They just wing it. That's not true. I always go back and read it after I've made some mistakes. After it's like It makes all more sense then. Am I right, gentlemen? Am I right? What? Just do it right the first time. <laughs> instruction manuals, they don't come with. And from day one, we can be terrified, so scared. I remember just watching them breathe. Are they still breathing while they're sleeping? Are they still breathing in the middle of the night? Is he still breathing? <laughs> you know, just checking on them when they're first brand new and you bring them home and you're just so worried and anxious about everything. And then think about like their first day of kindergarten. Oh, that can be a hard one. And then how about when they start wanting to have sleepovers? That can definitely be worrisome still can be even as they get older if it's like a new person or something and then what about driving that has been one of the scariest things and we're about to do it with number two this summer i'm you doing it i'm not doing it it was mm -mm, mm -mm, not doing it no <laughs> last time i was in a car <laughs> <laughs> with one of our kids. Before he had his license, it was not pretty. There was actual damage done to this property. <laughs> You're nope, stone cold not, selling him out. Not talking about it anymore. <laughs> if we had a church bus, you'd be throwing him under it right now. Just. <laughs> and then what about dating? Oh, I know, right? It's not good. And then we're about to do this, experience this with our oldest, is the leaving. They've grown up and they're ready to go. So we can easily just sit and worry and be anxious and live in fear with every moment of our kids' lives. All these are great opportunities for us to be 
anxious, and in fear. Yeah. I remember one of the funniest memories is when we first came here, and uh, one of the children's workers, pretty much our kids were the only kids back in those days, and uh, the, the, the teacher that was watching our boys came to us in just shock and horror on their face, just like, they punch each other in the face! And we're like, we have a word for that. It's called Tuesday. It's, <laughs> this is normal in the world when you've got multiple boys in the house. Brothers. But in uh, 2 Timothy here, we see the Apostle Paul is essentially handing off the baton to the next generation. That's the, the context of what's going on here. Throughout the book of Acts and, and much of the New Testament, there are, we, we see the first generation church at work. We see what's happening in the first generation church. The first people to lead the ministry after Jesus had left this earth. And now we, we fast forward a few years and we see the Apostle Paul is handing off the baton to Timothy. So Timothy, this is an important detail, Timothy is a young pastor like us. Very young. Yes. I expected to get a big amen from you people. Timothy is a young pastor like us. So we're going to pick up this story. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. It says this, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience just as my ancestors did. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. So Paul is expressing his love for Timothy. And in the very next verse, we see these two new characters come onto the scene. And their names are Lois and Eunice. And they are Timothy's grandmother and mother. They have had such an impact in the life of Timothy. They've had such an influence. They've played such a role that the Apostle Paul is essentially acknowledging their role in Timothy's life, saying that Timothy would not be the man of faith that he is today without them. So let's look at verse 5. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. So Paul is saying to Timothy, if it was not for your mama and your grandmama, if it was not for the powerful women of faith in your life who demonstrated, who prayed over you, who, who taught you how to be a good man, who taught you how to do what was right, who made you do your chores, who made you stand up straight, who made you do what you needed to do even when you didn't want to do it. If it was not for them, you would not be the man of faith that you are today. And that's the faith that we as parents demonstrate in the lives of our kids. Amen. And that is why it is so important for us moms, especially, to have strong faith and to demonstrate strong faith to our kids. Our job is so much bigger than clothes and food and play dates and wiping snotty noses. Amen? Sometimes yeah. we get in that mundane and we think that that's all it is. But it's not. It's so, so much bigger than that. It's our job given by God. The most important job we'll ever be given is to be entrusted with one of his children and to raise one of his children in the Lord. Amen? I see so many moms these days afraid to lead their children. Yeah. Be the parent. Be the adult. Be a mom. It's hard. Nobody said it was easy. It's hard to do, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And one of the scariest things we can do as a parent is to make our kids do what they don't want to do. Admit it. We don't want that initial reaction from them and that initial consequence that we have to deal with of them maybe throwing a tantrum or doing whatever they're going to do. Maybe it's in front of other people and we're just going to be embarrassed about that. But guess what? It's our job to make them do the things that they don't want to do. 
And we need to fear the lifelong consequences much more than that immediate consequence. Because we need to raise them as strong, confident people in Christ. Amen? Yeah, very good. Some of the hard things we have to tell them to do is some of the simple things. But it's like, they got to go to school. They don't get to not go to school. They have to eat their vegetables. They have to go to bed. They have to brush their teeth. They have to do their chores. They have to go to class at church. Amen? Can be hard. But it's not their choice. It's your choice. Amen? So, raise them to be strong people of faith. And you demonstrating that is the best way to do that. It can be scary, but it's our jobs as moms and parents. I have a quick story to share <clears throat> about my grandma and my mom. So we're talking about Lois and Eunice in the Bible. But I want to talk about Fawn and Jerry for a moment. My mom, Fawn, is actually in the room. So it's kind of fun she gets to be here while I share this story. But my mother and my grandmother instilled many, many things in me and left a legacy for me. And one of the things that they instilled in me is a strong work ethic. When I was young, I wanted things, okay? My mom provided my needs, but I had wants, okay? I wanted name brand stuff, I wanted makeup, I wanted things, we all want things, right? So she and my grandmother had a great plan. I, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> but starting at the age of 12, I worked in a berry field picking berries, raspberries and strawberries. I did it for three years, and it was hot, <laughs> and it was dirty, and it was long hours. And it was really early mornings. Okay, it was miserable. <laughs> but I did it. I did it faithfully. Like I said, I did it for three years with my mother and my grandmother's example and encouragement. And then I was promoted <laughs> from berry picker Head to... berry picker? <laughs> no. I never was head berry picker. I got to Junior be the, berry picker. <laughs> I got to be the berry stand attendant. And I got to sit at the little stand with a roof on it, so not in direct sunlight, selling the berries everybody else picked. And so I would say that because of that, I have a great, great worth work ethic in my right. life. So that's how you when you were a teenager, when you wanted money for clothes or fun things. You didn't, it wasn't an entitlement to you. You actually had to go out and work for it and I earn did. that. And then this, this strange reaction happened in your life that when you were a little older, you had respect for other people and a sense of responsibility. Amen. <laughs> I do. Amen. And a lot and of respect for hard workers. And that's the power of the influence of a mom and a grandma. Come on, can we get a big amen? amen. That is the power of a mom and a grandma. So Lois and Eunice, Timothy's mom and grandma have left a legacy of faith in Timothy. And because of that legacy of faith, he's now a protege to the Apostle Paul. Now, there's not, a, not very many people that you and I can recognize in the Bible as being significant, influential characters in the gospel, in the New Testament. Am I right? So he's, he's kind of a big deal in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is a very influential person. Now Timothy is his protege. He is serving under the most influential person in the New Testament. And that never would have happened if it had not been for Lois and Eunice pouring their faith into him, pouring their character into him, pouring their diligence into him. So I think poor Lois and Eunice get woefully too little credit for how Timothy turned down in the story. So now let's go on to, to 
to verse 6. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. So Paul is telling you, Paul is telling Timothy, I'm reminding you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you. It's not an automatic process. Say it's not automatic. God put a gift inside you, and the development of that gift is not an automatic process. Pick up your iPad. Come on. The development of that gift, the development of the gift of God inside of you is not an automatic process. You have to fan the flames. You have to be diligent. You have to be responsible. You have to be consistent. You have to pursue That gift that God has put in you. And that's when we get to verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. I'm telling you, there's something powerful when we understand the great context of that scripture. It wasn't saying that, Timothy, you don't need to be scared of the dark. You don't need to be scared of the boogeyman. You don't need to be scared of other people. That's not what Paul was talking about. He was saying, you don't have to be afraid to fan into flames the spiritual gift that was put in you by God when I laid my hands on you. And it is a result of your grandmother and your mother. That legacy of faith. You don't have to be afraid to pursue what God has put into you. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have hung on to this verse before. God hasn't given me a spirit. Come on, let me see your hands. You've, you've clinged to that verse. You've read that verse. You've said, that's my verse. I want you to think of this. If it had not been for Timothy's grandmother and his mother, you probably never would have read that verse. Think about that. Forget your head around that for a minute, all you moms and grandmas. If it had not been for Lois in Eunice. I'm betting that you and I never would have read that verse. And this is where we want to close today. We want to encourage you to fan the flames of the spiritual gift that God's put in you. And fanning those flames takes courage. Think of it. It takes courage self-discipline and love it takes courage because God didn't give us a spirit of fear God did not give you a spirit of fear when we feel that fear that fear does not come from God but God gave us a spirit of power and love and self-discipline I want to tell you today there's just There's no such thing as just a parent or just a grandparent. Our roles as parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, we are shaping and we are molding the next generation. We are either going to produce Timothys or we're going to produce an absence of Timothys in our cultures today. So when we look around our culture today, And we want to say that the next generation may not be shaping up to be the way we want it to be. There's only one place that we need to look in order to find the change. And that's look right at ourselves as parents and grandparents. It takes power, love, and self-discipline. It takes courage for us to pour our hearts into them, for us to be brave enough to say, I know you don't want to do it. I know it makes you sad. I know you don't like it. But this is what needs to happen. And I'm telling you right now that you're going to square, you're going to look the disappointment of your child right in the face. And you're going to see that you're going to have to choose between making them happy all the time or doing what's best for them all the time. It takes courage to make the right choice in those moments. It takes a spirit of power spirit of love and a spirit of self-discipline hey thanks for watching the full life family church youtube channel 
Our goal is to bring you engaging content that adds value to your life. If you like this video, then give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more, then click that subscribe button. You can always find out more about us at flfc.church. We'll see you next time.